Can you bow down for prayer? <laughs> Heavenly Father, we praise you and worship you and glorify your name. As you are sitting on your heavenly throne in glory, majesty and splendor. The 24 elders and the living beings praise you and worship you continuously. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord Most High, who was, who is and who is to come. Lord, the members, be the members of the Epony Baptist Church and all of us who gathered here. Praise you and worship you. Heavenly Father, thank you for giving us a good night's sleep and showing us a beautiful day and helping us to come to church to praise and worship you, Lord. Lord, we're praying for each one of our church members, everyone who's gathered here. Strengthen each one of us, Lord. Have mercy on each one of us and strengthen us in every area of our lives. Lord, you're praying for our Sunday school, our women's group, and all the organizations of the church. We're praying for the missionaries we're supporting. Strengthen each one of them. Bless them. And then to bring glory to your name. Lord, we're praying for our members who are not <coughs> feeling so well. We're praying for Rebecca Standing, Lily, Paul Bevington, give them the grace they need, Heavenly Father, give them the healing touch they need. Lord, if anyone has come to this church with a heavy heart, touch each one of them. Give them the grace they need. Let your Holy Spirit hover over them and give them all the fruits of the Holy Spirit. Help each one of us to have love, Peace, joy, kindness, goodness, gentleness, patience, faithfulness, and self-control from above. Lord, as your servant, Will Trump is going to speak from Acts chapter 2, give him the grace he needs. Let the meditation of our hearts be acceptable to you, Lord. All this we ask in the most precious name of the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. Well, there is an announcement. On Tuesday, the 17th of January, there will be a brief members meeting before the prayer. Uh, can we all uh, stand up to sing the second hymn? Breathe, breathe on me. Breath of God, breathe on me, breath of God.
Morning. Lovely to be with you once again. I think this is my third visit. And actually, it was really lovely to have Johnny and Hannah and Esme with us in Brentwood last Sunday. Our church has actually just moved to a Sunday afternoon service because we've had to move venue. So it was great that they were able to visit. They actually came around to our house afterwards for pizzas, and it was just nice to spend time together ahead of, of this visit on, uh, on this Sunday. Lovely to be with you. And I'm delighted to bring you God's word from Acts chapter 2, a very famous story, the day of Pentecost, that I think has got a lot to teach us, especially at the start of a new year, as we try and get our expectations aligned with God's word and his plans for us. So before I read it, let me pray as we come to God's word. Heavenly Father, we just heard that your word is living and active Thank you that 2,000 years ago, when you poured out your spirit at Pentecost and people asked the question, what does this mean? Thank you that the Apostle Peter stood up and gave an answer. Thank you that this is recorded for us in your word and we can look at it now together. And Lord, as we look at your word and we grapple with the implications of the message that Jesus is Lord, please work in each of our hearts this morning by your spirit to make us respond rightly and make us glad followers of the Lord Jesus, because we ask it in his powerful name. Amen. A question before we come to read Acts chapter 2. Pentecostal. When you hear that word, what do you think? Pentecostal. What images come to your mind? Pentecostal. I did a bit of a survey. I asked my friends about this, and they said, kind of very big emotions, you know, happy, clappy. People stood on their feet, arms in the air, praising God, maybe miracles, healings, tongues. People praising the Lord, feeling it really strongly in themselves, feeling the Spirit's presence with them. Big emotions, big experiences, Pentecostal. And maybe you think to yourself, I wish I had that. I sometimes think that. I wish I had that. I wish I felt it a little bit more. Am I missing something? You know, I'm a Christian. I, I know that Jesus died for me. Maybe that's what you would say as well. But I don't really feel it that much day to day. Am I missing something? That's kind of our key question for this morning. Am I missing something? You know, if we think back to the early days of the church, it seems like they had much bigger experiences of what was going on there. Or if we think about other churches, we might think they have bigger experiences. Are they feeling it more than I am? Is this church, is Upney Baptist, is it selling you short? Whatever Pentecostal means, we kind of want a bit of it, don't we? Well, the question we have to ask is, what are the true roots of Pentecostal Christianity? And of course, there's nowhere better to go than the original day of Pentecost. Let's look at the roots themselves and see what it teaches us. I think it will help us a lot with that question, am I missing something, as we look at the first day of Pentecost? But we're going to be surprised at the answers. Prepare this morning to be surprised by the answers. As we go through, we're going to hold up God's word, and we're going to try and line up our expectations to God's word, not the other way around. We tend to do it the other way around. We tend to have our expectations, and we want God's word to fit in with them. We're going to do it the other way around, hold up the Bible, and line up our expectations. So please, open your Bibles, look up Acts chapter 2. We're going to read just the first 21 verses of Acts chapter 2, the day of Pentecost. Starting at verse 1. When the day of Pentecost arrived, they were all together in one place, And suddenly there came from heaven a sound like a mighty rushing wind, and it filled the entire house where they were sitting. And divided tongues as of fire appeared to them and rested on each one of them, and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. Now, there were dwelling in Jerusalem Jews, devout men from every nation under heaven. And at this sound, the multitude came together And they were bewildered because each one was hearing them speak in his own language. And they were amazed and astonished, saying, Are not all these who are speaking Galileans? And how is it that we hear each one of us in his own native language? Parthians and Medes and Elamites and 
residents of Mesopotamia, Judea and Cappadocia, Pontus and Asia, Phrygia and Pamphylia, Egypt and the parts of Libya belonging to Cyrene, and visitors from Rome, both Jews and proselytes, Cretans and Arabians, we hear them telling in our own tongues the mighty works of God. And all were amazed and perplexed, saying to one another, what does this mean? But others, mocking, said, they are filled with new wine. But Peter, standing with the eleven, lifted up his voice and addressed them, men of Judea and all who dwell in Jerusalem, let this be known to you and give ear to my words. For these people are not drunk, as you suppose, since it is only the third hour of the day. But this is what was uttered through the prophet Joel. And in the last days it shall be, God declares, that I will pour out my spirit on all flesh, and your sons and your daughters shall prophesy, and your young men shall see visions, and your old men shall dream dreams. Even on my male servants and female servants in those days I will pour out my spirit, and they shall prophesy. And I will show wonders in the heavens above, and signs on the earth below, blood and fire and vapour of smoke. The sun shall be turned to darkness and the moon to blood before the day of the Lord comes, the great and magnificent day. And it shall come to pass that everyone who calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. What wonderful events are recorded here for us today. And what we're going to do is we're going to discuss briefly the events themselves, what happened, then we're going to talk about the significance. What does it mean? And what does it mean for us today? That's our three parts today. Our first point, quite simply, what, what happened on the day of Pentecost? Well, what happened is that God pours out his spirit and people speak. God pours out his spirit and people speak. That's our first point this morning. The events themselves. Verse 1, we're told the disciples are all gathered together in Jerusalem. It's the Feast of Pentecost, which is a Jewish festival that took place 50 days after Passover. That's why it's called Pentecost, Pente for 50, like Pentagon. 50 days after, Jeru after Passover, they're in Jerusalem all together. And in verse 2, suddenly, suddenly something big happens. What is it that happens? Well, at least four things take place. Firstly, a mighty rushing wind. Do you see that in verse 2? Well, actually, it's not a rushing wind itself, is it? It's the sound of a mighty rushing wind in verse 2. Immediately, we're drawing strong connections with God's presence. In the Old Testament, how did God part the Red Sea? With a strong wind, a strong sound of a mighty wind. God is present. And then in verse 3, the second thing that happens, divided tongues of fire. Well, actually, it's not divided tongues of fire. It's as of fire. Like... Fire is the closest thing they could use to describe what was happening. And again, big link back to God's presence. Think about the burning bush or the, the, the pillar of fire that led the Israelites. God is present. And in verse 4, they were filled with the Holy Spirit. God is pouring out his Holy Spirit all over the disciples. Just as he had predicted he would, Jesus said, you will receive the power from on high not many days from now. And even John the Baptist had said, I baptize you with water, but one is coming who will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. It's happening. And if you think that's quite surprising in terms of the events, it is quite alarming. Actually, that's not the most alarming thing. The thing that gets everyone really surprised and perplexed in this passage is what comes next, the end of verse 4. They were filled with the Holy Spirit and they began to speak. They began to speak. They speak in other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. And that seems to be the main thing that gets everyone surprised, perplexed, and amazed. Now, what does that mean, other tongues? The word that's used here in verse 4, and then again in verse 11, in the Greek is the word glossa, which I think we get the word glossary from that, so it's connected to words, glossa. That word in Greek can be translated language or tongues. So we think, is it tongues? Is it languages? And it's led to some confusion. Is it understandable speech or is it unintelligible speech, like a kind of heavenly language, like a babble that no one can understand? Is that what's going on here? Well, in the New Testament, there is evidence, isn't there, of 
unintelligible speech, tongues being used, but we can say for sure that that's not what's going on here. I'll just say that again. We can be sure that that's not what's going on here. Why am I so confident? Well, actually, there are two other words used to describe these languages, these tongues being used here. That's in verse 8 and verse 11. In verse 8, how is it that we hear each of us in his native language? And then verse 11, we hear them telling in our own tongues. But there, in verse 8 and verse 11, the word in Greek is dialecto, which just means language. So you've got language or tongues, and then languages only. So it's clearly languages that's going on. It's other languages. The other point is that, what is it that surprises the crowds? Is it that it's unintelligible speech? No, they're surprised because they can understand. That's the whole point. These are understandable languages. So it's a bit like someone switching into a foreign language that they weren't able to speak a minute ago and being able to speak it fluently. The Holy Spirit wants this message to go global in Jerusalem where all these nations are present. The real miracle of Pentecost when the Holy Spirit comes is proclamation, a miracle of speech. That's quite striking, isn't it? When we think about it, we think Holy Spirit, we tend to think big emotional experiences. And actually, when the Holy Spirit came the first time here, what comes out is speech and a long sermon by Peter. Does that fit with our expectations of the Holy Spirit's work? Proclamation. Let's think about this on, on a big scale. You know, you come across a, a movement, a church movement, a church group that really emphasizes the role of the Holy Spirit, maybe even has the word Pentecostal on the label. What you, should you expect? Well, from the first day of Pentecost, what you should expect from that kind of movement is an emphasis on proclaiming the Lord Jesus. Is it all about proclamation? Is it telling people about Jesus? And on a small scale, think about what would it look like for me or you to be a Pentecostal Christian according to the first events of this day? Well, maybe it's that you pluck up the courage to tell a neighbor about your faith or a colleague at work. Um, and it's pretty scary. And you jumble up your words a bit, you struggle a bit, but you say something about your faith or you invite someone to church, you open the Bible with someone. The way we should react to that is saying, Wow, that is spirit-enabled, Pentecostal Christianity right there as you proclaim Jesus. Or maybe a parent in the room here who during the week tries on a Tuesday morning to open up the Bible for five minutes with their kids over breakfast. It's chaotic, it's messy, but let's start the day looking at the Bible or in the evening, finish the day talking about the Lord Jesus. Wow, that's spirit-enabled, Pentecostal Christianity, isn't it? Proclaiming Jesus. I've actually got a friend who lives in Luxembourg. I don't know if anyone knows where Luxembourg is. It's near the south of Belgium and France and Germany. Very small country. Turns out they don't have the Bible in their own language yet. Now, many of them speak French and English and German, but they don't have the Bible in Luxembourgish. A few hundred thousand people. So my friend Odile, she is translating the Bible into Luxembourgish. So she sat there at her desk with the Greek Bible, the Hebrew Bible, trying to translate it into Luxembourgish. Wow, that spirit-enabled Pentecostal Christianity, isn't it? Other languages proclaiming Jesus. Does that fit with our expectations of Pentecostal Christianity? Well, it should from the first day of Pentecost. Now, that's just the raw events of what took place. How would you have reacted if you'd been there on the day? How would I have reacted? Probably surprised, right? This stuff doesn't happen every day. And that's what we see happening here, isn't it? In seven verses, we're told seven times in different ways that people are surprised. In verse six, they're bewildered. In verse seven, they're astonished. In verse seven and 12, we're told twice that they're amazed. In verse 12, they're perplexed. In verse eight, they're asking, how is this possible? And in verse 12, they're asking, what does this mean? They're amazed, they're perplexed. They're asking questions, what does this mean? which, by the way, is a clue that people need the Christian message explained to them. They can't just figure it out by just looking in at Christians or looking at these events. They need an explanation, hence the proclamation. But did you see as well, we've got the cynics. Look down at verse 13 with me. But others, mocking, said, they're filled with new wine. 
It's strangely comforting, I think, that what we see around us today is exactly what happened on day one, the launch of the global church. Some people saying, what does this mean? I want to look into it. Others saying, nah, this is nonsense. It's mad. They're off their heads. They're crazy. They might as well be drunk. People want to dismiss the Christian message without even looking into it. And in this case, they're clearly willing to be almost irrational in the process. You know, Peter makes the point that at that time in the day, it's impossible to be drunk in that society. And also, it makes no sense because the more you drink, the less understandable you become, right? And here, they're very understandable to people in their languages. So it doesn't make any sense as an argument. But some people are so keen to dismiss the Christian message because they don't like the implications of it that they will say anything, they will mock, they will dismiss. And we see that again today. Maybe you come across a lot of that in your life. I come across a bit of it. And it's somewhat comforting that it was the same thing on day one. But many of them ask this question, what does it mean? And what I love about the Bible is it doesn't just give us events, it gives us meaning. What does it mean? Well, that's our second point this morning. What does it mean what's going on on the day of Pentecost? Well, it means that the final chapter of history has begun in which everyone who calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. What does it mean what's going on at Pentecost? Well, it's our second point. It means that the final chapter of history has begun in which everyone who calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. I realize that's a very long sentence and uh, apologies for that. I just, I had to get it all in. It's, It's all there. The final chapter of history has begun in which everyone who calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. Peter gets up on his feet. Do you see that in verse 14? This is the same Peter who 50 days earlier denied even knowing Jesus. And here he's willing to get up and stand in the same place that condemned Jesus to death 50 days earlier. He's willing to stand up and be counted and proclaim his faith. It's wonderful to see. What does he do? Well, it's quite surprising that the first thing he does is take us back to an Old Testament prophet, the prophet Joel. He will come on to talk about Jesus being Lord. That's the the bulk of the sermon. Please read on Acts chapter 2. But firstly, he wants to say, what's going on here, guys, is what Joel was talking about. I mean, they would all have known Joel. They would have learned about Joel in their kids' Sunday schools. They'd have studied it. They'd have known the key message of Joel. And what Peter is saying, you remember that prophet Joel who talked about a future day that would come when God would pour out his spirit on all people and they would all prophesy That's what's happening in front of your very eyes. That makes more sense of these happenings than alcohol or anything like that. No, that's what's happening. It's a really big deal, actually. If you think about your Old Testament, God's word came very rarely. Prophecies came to key kings or prophets down the years, but it was quite few and far between. And here, suddenly, that same knowledge of God that prophets had All people can have, all Christians, your sons and your daughters, can all have access to that same knowledge. What a privilege. But actually, it's more than just privilege. It is a privilege. It's actually about inauguration. You know, we've got a new king, right? Immediately became king when the the late queen died. But actually, we're going to have the coronation, a kind of official inauguration when something starts. And here, Pentecost is the biggest inauguration of them all. By taking us to the prophet Joel, Peter is doing something very specific because Joel is is a short book in the Bible. It's just three chapters long, and the key theme is a future day of the Lord that would come, a future time when God would finally establish his kingdom. And Peter is saying, that's happening now. Do you see that? Verse 17, it says, in the last days. And verse 18, it also says, in those days, that era That chapter, that final chapter has now arrived. It's now begun. It's like Pentecost is the firing gun on the final chapter. It's now happened. The starting gun has been fired. So the primary significance of these events at Pentecost is inauguration. The the primary miracle is proclamation. The primary significance is inauguration, the start of a new era. But an era about what? It's, It's a fair question to ask, isn't it? New chapter, final chapter, but what's available in this final chapter? And that's what Peter does next. By quoting Joel, if you look at verse 21, the kind of culmination of this uh, quotation from the Old Testament tells us exactly what's on offer 
ever since Pentecost. Let me read verse 21. And it shall come to pass that everyone who calls upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. That is the wonderful news that it's available ever since Pentecost, all the way through to us today. And I think we're so familiar with these words, we kind of let them wash over us, but let, let it sink in. Everyone. It's now available to all. Historically, it seemed that it was very restricted to the people of Israel, and now everyone, available to all. And it means it's available to you today. Whatever your credentials, you might have loads of amazing things in your past or loads of horrendous stuff in your past. Or like most of us, it's probably a bit of a mixed bag. It's available to everyone. And do you see a picture of that everyone in this passage? Do you see sons and daughters? So there's no sexism in the kingdom of God. Men and women, young and old, do you see that? Your young men and your old men shall see dreams and, and visions. There's room for everyone in the kingdom, young and old. You're never too young to follow the Lord Jesus. You're never too old to be one of his people. There's no class divide. You've got servants and free men there in verse 18. There's no racism because it's all nations. Did you see that? The list of places I, I wheeled off include Asia, Africa, the Middle East, and it's all the way reached here to the UK. Anyone, everyone is invited and it's everyone who calls on the name of the Lord. That's the key criteria, calling on the name of the Lord. And some people think, isn't that a bit too easy? Surely I need to earn my way with God, don't I? Isn't there a tick box list I need to cross off? You know, this and that pilgrimage, giving this much money away, doing this and that and the other. No, call on the name of the Lord. That is the only criteria to be one of his people. Call on the name of the Lord. What does it mean to call on the name of the Lord? I think it means to call out to him for help and rescue and salvation, knowing that I've given up trying to achieve it myself. I can't get myself to God myself. I need his help. I call on the name of the Lord. I call out to him. And if you call on the name of the Lord, then you shall be saved. That's the end of verse 21. Shall be saved. Not might be saved. Not let's see how it goes on the last day. Let's See how much you've earned in terms of brownie points. No, shall be saved. What glorious assurance for you today. The Bible's message is that we need saving. I know that's not very popular in this day and age. We need saving. We are all by nature rebels against God one way or another, and we need saving. And Jesus is God's son who came on a rescue mission to save us. And I've got to say, if there's someone here today who hasn't yet taken hold of that for themselves, Please do. Please turn to the Lord Jesus as your saviour. Call out to him. And I must say this as well. Do it before it's too late. I know it's not popular to talk about deadlines, but actually, if you look at verse 20 with me, you'll see that there is a deadline baked into this prophecy of Joel. Did you see that? Before the day of the Lord comes, the great and magnificent day. If the final era has begun, if it's been inaugurated, then by definition it will come to an end when the Lord Jesus returns. That is the day of the Lord. Actually, if you read Joel, you would probably be surprised at how scary the day of the Lord is. It actually says in chapter 1, alas, for the day of the Lord, because when God returns, when he sends his son to return, it will be a terrible day for God's enemies, for those who have rejected Jesus. Return to him today. Call on your future judge to be your present saviour. I heard that sentence recently. It's really stuck with me. It's a kind of summary of the gospel. Call on your future judge to be your present saviour. Now, we've got one more thing to clarify. My key question for this morning was, am I missing something? And maybe you're thinking, well, it was obvious to them then, right? I mean, they got all the signs. They got the fire, the wind, the Holy Spirit, you know, they spoke in languages, it's all right for them. They were in no doubt that they had the Holy Spirit. What about me today? I still don't feel it inside me. Well, the Bible's message is that you too have the same Holy Spirit, the Spirit of Jesus living in you if you trust him as your saviour today. And that's our third point this morning. Today, you have the same Spirit living in you if you trust Jesus for your salvation. You have the same Spirit of Jesus living in you, if you trust Jesus for your salvation. The New Testament is crystal clear on this point. Uh, 
Ephesians 1 verse 13, for example, when you heard the gospel of your salvation and believed in him, you were sealed with the promised Holy Spirit. When you believe and trust Jesus, you are sealed with the Holy Spirit. Jesus comes to dwell within you by his Spirit. Don't be in any doubts about this. If you're a Christian, you have the Spirit dwelling in you, quite simply because you couldn't be a Christian without the Spirit's work in you. It is helpful, I think, on this point, to remember what is available since Pentecost and its salvation. That's what we saw, the main offer of Pentecost is salvation. That helps us when we get our expectations wrong, because we think, if I've got the Holy Spirit in me, I should be experiencing enormous big emotions, kind of euphoric, ecstatic stuff. But actually, if we remember that the main message of Pentecost is salvation, that is actually what we've received since Pentecost. I think we maybe get, get this wrong because the disciples, those first 12 or 120, because they received the Spirit in this extraordinary way, we think we need to as well. Sometimes that's how Christians feel, isn't it? But is that actually right? Now, I do want to be really clear that I'm not saying for one minute that Christians don't or shouldn't or can't have big experiences. Absolutely, it's fantastic when we feel uh, really excited, uh, passionate about the Lord's work in our lives. But should we expect these euphoric experiences to come? Can we demand them? Well, actually, there's no indication in this text that we should. Actually, if you keep reading this sermon of Peter's, you'll notice that by the end of it, 3,000 people become Christians, and their main experience is that they're cut to the heart. They say, what should we do? And Peter says, repent, be baptized, and you will receive the forgiveness of sins and the gift of the Holy Spirit. But he doesn't say it will be accompanied with any big miraculous signs or experiences. There's no description given of that. And if they were really important and they had taken place, then Luke would have recorded it for us. So in other words, we shouldn't expect our experiences to be a bit like these 12 disciples with the tongues of fire and the big signs, but actually more like the 3,000 believers by the end of this chapter who, dare I say, quite simply respond in repentance and faith and they receive the Holy Spirit. So we can say that on Inauguration Day, which is the day of Pentecost, the Holy Spirit came in great fanfare. It was a really big deal. It really was extraordinary. But we can also say that the same Holy Spirit is received by every Christian today through the ages in a ordinary way, you could say. You could actually say it's not really ordinary because it's a miracle, Jesus' Spirit coming to live with you, but it's miraculously ordinary. Can I um, draw an analogy here to the COVID vaccine? Does anyone remember the first vaccine that was uh, handed out? I remember they, it was a lady called Margaret Keenan. I think she was 90 year old from Coventry. And all the camera crews were there in the hospital. The press was there. The prime minister probably tried to make an appearance as well. What a huge big deal, right? The fanfare, because it was the inauguration. It's the first one being handed out. But if you were next in line, you know, six weeks later, six months later, you got exactly the same vaccine. And if you demanded the camera crews, uh, where's the media, they would have said, no, you're here for inoculation, not stardom. You know? So in a similar way, inauguration, the day of Pentecost, the Holy Spirit arrives in great fanfare, but the same Holy Spirit comes to every believer down the ages. You have received the Holy Spirit if you are a believer. And so I want to come to the final question of the morning. We started off by saying, I'm, I'm not feeling it. Am I missing something? And actually, the New Testament would flip that question on its head. Rather than say, why am I, am I not feeling the Holy Spirit in me today? The New Testament would say, am I living consistently with the fact that I have Jesus' Spirit in me? I'll just say that again. We like to ask the question, why am I not feeling the Holy Spirit in me? The New Testament asks the question, am I living, are you living consistently with the reality that you have Jesus' spirit living inside of you. Now that's a much more searching and uncomfortable question, isn't it? Am I living consistently with the fact that I have his spirit in me? And how do we do that? Well, the Bible is full of instructions. If that's the question we're asking, how can I live consistently 
with Jesus' spirit in me. Let me give you four practical ways you can do that. The first one maybe is all you need is just that reminder that you have been saved. The main message of Pentecost is salvation. The main offer of Pentecost isn't euphoric experiences, it's salvation. We have been saved by the Lord Jesus if we call out to him. That's the most amazing news ever, isn't it? And yet somehow we get bored of it. We want to move on from it. How could we do that? Number two, in the New Testament, the work of the Holy Spirit is intricately linked with the word of God. You have parallel passages in Ephesians and Colossians that kind of say exactly the same thing. In one passage it says, be filled with the Holy Spirit. In the other passage it says, let the word of Christ dwell in you richly. It's the same work. The Holy Spirit, God's word, they work together. So are we feeding on God's word? Which is where we feel the presence of the Holy Spirit and God speaks to us through his word. I think sometimes we close our Bibles and we say, I want to hear from the Holy Spirit. That's madness. The Lord speaks to us through his word. It's a bit like saying, I'm really quite hungry today. I'm starving, but I haven't eaten for a long time. It's like, well, yeah, why don't you open your Bible, feed on God's word, and experience the Holy Spirit's work in your life. Number three, are we proclaiming? The biggest surprise for me in this passage is that when the Holy Spirit comes down, what comes out is proclamation. And I can tell you, in all honesty, that I've never felt closer in dependence to the Lord Jesus than when I actually open my mouth and try and tell someone about the Lord Jesus. As I said earlier, it's pretty scary. It's chaotic. You jumble your words. But actually, when you rely on the Lord Jesus to go and tell someone, you hand out some flyers, you knock on some doors, you open the Bible with someone, you really feel dependence on the Lord Jesus and his word. We want to feel the work of the Holy Spirit in our lives. Let's get on board with this program of proclamation. That's what they did on day one. Why do we think it should be any different 2,000 years later? And fourthly, finally, is there anything coming between you and the Lord Jesus? The New Testament talks about grieving the Holy Spirit through unrepentant sin or higher allegiances that we might have. We should not expect to feel the Holy Spirit at work in our life if we ourselves are actively fighting it through unrepentant sin, through higher allegiances. Maybe it's work or a specific relationship or sinful behaviors you refuse to give up. These things get in the way of our fellowship with the Lord Jesus. So there we have it from God's word this morning, from the original day of Pentecost. How do our expectations line up with God's word? We've seen that the primary miracle of Pentecost is proclamation. That's the first thing they did. They spoke. Are we the same? The primary significance of the day of Pentecost, inauguration, this final chapter opened in which anyone who calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. That's the primary offer of Pentecost, salvation. So I'm now going to pray that we will live in the light of this. I pray that each one of us will live with the right expectations and with a desire to live lives that are consistent with the fact that if we follow Jesus, we have his spirit in us. And I pray that we have a desire to make him known to those around us. Please join me now as I lead us in prayer. Heavenly Father, thank you that the same Lord Jesus who was with the disciples in person is with us now in spirit ever since the day of Pentecost as we call out on the name of the Lord and we receive his salvation, which we so desperately need. Thank you, Lord, for your spirit living in us, which we experience as we open your word and we hear from you, which we experience as we are in fellowship with one another and as we proclaim you to those around us. Lord, please, this year, 2023, make us all get on board with your program of gospel growth as we take this wonderful message to those around us. Lord, make us joyful, committed followers of the Lord Jesus until the day that he returns. Amen. Amen. I think we're now going to sing our final hymn, Cornerstone. Please stand up and sing as the music starts. <clears throat>